I wonder when was the last time you really had the opportunity to look at the night sky on a clear night and marvel at the wonder and beauty of the stars. Living in a city as most of us do of course we don't really get the full glory of the night sky. All the light pollution from the, the, the street lights and uh, all the lights around us tends to blind us to those fainter stars that would otherwise fill the sky. To really enjoy the night sky you need to go far away from town and city into the deep countryside and then look up and, uh, and just see if you can count the stars. I remember years ago uh, I was on a holiday with a family in northern France on a camping holiday uh, and uh, in the early hours of the morning the, uh, the call of nature uh, woke me up and uh, I had to, uh, to make the, uh, the journey up to the toilet block uh, and as I walked up to the, um, uh, along the, the, the sort of footpath I looked up at the sky and I was blown away by the sheer beauty and the number of, scars, of stars I saw in the sky that night. Stars I had never seen in all my time uh, as, uh, in, in, in London. Uh, and as I got back to the tent, um, I just paused again and looked up. And as I, as I did so, I saw this sort of streak of light going across uh, the, the, uh, the dark sky. And, I, and uh, it was a shooting star. I'd never seen one before, never seen one since. Gazing up at the night sky can make you feel uh, so small and so insignificant. This vastness of space, this, uh, these points of light that are actually huge stars, bigger than our own sun. It's easy to understand, I think, the fascination that some people have with the night sky and with space and the universe. Since the birth of humanity, the beauty, the majesty, the mystery of the stars has given rise to speculation that their ordered movement across the sky must perhaps mean something, must have some, some, uh, uh, some significance. Scientists and astronomers have spent billions of pounds on, on uh, telescopes and probes and rockets and spaceships to try and better understand something more of the universe, of, uh, of the, uh, the stars. The closest star, this, the, the universe is so huge, the closest star to planet Earth uh, is called Alpha Centauri. And it's actually a collection of three stars, um, and it's four and a quarter light years from Earth. Uh, which means that if, I don't know where you need to go in on planet Earth to, uh, to, to see Alpha Centauri, uh, but if you went and uh, looked at it tonight, you would be looking at light that left uh, that star in September 2016, four and a quarter years ago. Uh, but then we're just a tiny speck in, the, in our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is itself a hundred thousand light years across in diameter. And then we learn that uh, the Milky Way, our glorious galaxy, is a tiny speck compared to some of the other galaxies in the universe uh, and is itself, you know, just so terribly, terribly small in the great vastness of space. It's no wonder then that people have looked to the ordered beauty of the stars for answers to life, the universe and everything. But for followers of Jesus, for those of us that look to the word of God before we start gazing at the stars, there is something even more glorious that blows our minds. We read this in John 1 verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. God made all this. He made our planet, our solar system, our galaxy, uh, and all the stars and solar systems and galaxies that make up the infinite vastness of the universe. Our God is a big, big, powerful, wonderful God. This fascination with space, of course, isn't something new or, or recent. And the story we're looking at today on, this, on our, our sort of journey towards Bethlehem is about a, very, uh, a group of very clever, wealthy, wise men who were students of the stars and the planets uh, more than 2,000 years ago. The Bible tells us that they came from the east 
and the general view is that they probably came from the city of Babylon, about 900 miles from Jerusalem. In Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2, the Bible introduces these wise men to us as follows. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. In their diligent study of the night sky, these men had seen something that had grabbed their attention. We don't know exactly what it was that they saw, whether it was the, the coming together uh, of, of you know, a star or planet uh, with another star or planet in their sort of movement across the sky and therefore a, a, a kind of a brightening uh, of the light. Whether it was something like that or whether it was just a purely supernatural uh, phenomenon, we do not know. But whatever they saw, they felt certain uh, in their hearts and their minds that they had, they had seen something very, very significant. They were convinced that they'd seen a sign in the heavens that had a really special meaning, that a new king had been born. And this king had been born uh, as the king of the ancient people of God, the Jews. This was this nation that had claimed a special relationship with the Lord God, a nation that didn't worship sun, moon or stars or ancestors or idols of wood or metal, but a nation that claimed a special significance in the plans and purposes of the Creator God. The hearts of these wise men were stirred. So sure were they that what they had seen was real and true and that had a, uh, had a huge significance, they knew they had to do something about it, they had to respond. They had to go and find this baby, they had to go and worship. They needed to take special gifts to this child, uh, gifts worthy of a great king. And so they embarked together on this journey, uh, again 900 miles journeying across from, uh, from Babylon to Jerusalem. This would be a dangerous journey, a, a journey through wilderness, a, a, a journey crossing sort of uh, national and territorial boundaries. Uh, there will be foreigners journeying in foreign lands, but they knew that they had to do this. They knew that they had seen something of great, great significance. And so here they are in Jerusalem, asking, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? And, and maybe as they arrived, they expected to find a city abuzz with the news, ah, oh, a new king has been born, uh, a son for the king uh, uh, has arrived. But no, they just find a city just you know, business as usual, people just sort of doing their thing. Uh, and when they ask this question, you know, where is this, uh, uh, this, this um, baby, this child born as king of the Jews? They just get blank looks. Uh, what are you talking about? There's been no royal birth. In fact, the more they keep asking, uh, the more the news seems to be creating a bit of uh, a sense of tension uh, in the city. And you can't help wonder if at this point in their mission they might have, have kind of thought, well, did we get it right? I mean, we were so sure that this was, you know, that what we saw in, in, in the night sky uh, had this great significance. But, you know, we're here in Jerusalem and it's quite clear that, you know, nothing like this has happened. Maybe the timing was wrong, uh, but they had been so sure. They had been so sure. But as they begin to perhaps wonder if they might have made a mistake, another character enters the story. Uh, King Herod. Uh, in Matthew's short account of this, he, he tells us in, in chapter 2, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, this question, uh, this um, uh, idea that a new king had been born, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. It's worth pausing here for a moment to allow the spotlight just to fall upon King Herod. Who was he? Where did he come from? How did he become king of Judea? The history books tell us that uh, Herod had ruled over the land of Israel for about 30 years by the time Jesus was born. Uh, and he wasn't a king for the lineage of David, so uh, in some ways you could say that his, his uh, kingship uh, over the Jews was somewhat suspect. In fact, he was half Jewish and half Edomite, uh, and the Edomites were sworn enemies uh, of the Jewish people. So, you know, not, uh, uh, not necessarily an obvious choice for the Jewish people to make their king. But the reality was he'd actually been given the kingship by the Romans, 
as a result of his own really clever manipulation and his political astuteness. He had tried so hard though as king, he'd invested you know, so much money, he'd done these great building projects around Jerusalem, he'd built a new uh, temple for the Jews to worship in. You know, he'd really made an effort, uh, this King Herod, but he still was this imposter as the king of the Jews. History tells us that towards the end of his reign he became increasingly paranoid about threats against him and his position as king. So much so that in later life he had uh, numerous wives and sons and others close to him killed because he was convinced that they were involved in some plot to overthrow him. Caesar Augustus famously quipped about Herod uh, that it was safer to be Herod's pig than his son. Uh, a, a play on words in the Greek language because the word for pig is uh, his and the word for son is heos. So better to be in the pigsty than in the palace back in Herod's day. And into this toxic atmosphere arrived these visitors from the east. No wonder Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Like as not, word of a new king was gonna, gonna, uh, that was going to compete with Herod would be uh, uh, a real problem. It was going to result in some, uh, uh, some unpleasantness at the very least. But Herod was also a brilliant manipulator. He knew how to persuade people to his cause. He knew how to put on a good act and charm people into believing him. And so he summons these visitors from the east. I wonder how these wise men felt about their summons into the presence of King Herod. Uh, I, I suspect their invitation uh, was given in such a way that they knew that they would be foolish to try to uh, refuse it. Given the atmosphere in the city and the way the people were looking at them, I think they might have uh, um, felt perhaps a little nervous about their encounter with this king. In hindsight, perhaps they thought maybe it was a bit of a mistake to come unannounced into this great city of Jerusalem and ask where the newborn king was. Maybe they had, ex they had uh, committed some uh, massive royal faux pas. But Herod was all sweetness and light. Uh, he would deserve an Oscar for the performance he was about to put on for these wise men. How thrilled he was to see them. How amazing to hear of this news of this newborn king. Of course, it, it was very strange that he hadn't been aware uh, of this birth. But if God was at work, well, how could he argue with that? No, of course he wasn't threatened by this news. He was delighted. He thanks them for taking the trouble to come all this way to worship this newborn king. He too would love the great privilege of being able to offer his, ho his own humble worship to this king. And then furthermore, to help them with their quest, he's got all these wise men from, uh, from Jerusalem, these high priests and scribes of the people, to really investigate, you know, where, where could this king have been born? They'd search their scriptures and they'd found that the king that they were probably looking for would have, wouldn't have been born in Jerusalem, but in the tiny town of Bethlehem, about six miles to the south. And so he suggests they continue their journey, and, and if, no, no, surely when they found this newborn king, please would they complete their kindness by returning to Jerusalem and letting him know where he could find this precious child so he too could come and offer his worship. And so these wise men leave uh, Herod's court relieved that they had not sort of committed some uh, terrible mistake, that there hadn't been this royal meltdown uh, and um, that Herod wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, not upset, but actually was supporting them in their cause and helping them along the way. But their gladness at Herod's support and the direction they'd been given was nothing compared to their joy when, as they leave King Herod's court, uh, to immediately continue their journey, they see the star once again. In Matthew 2 verse 10 it says this, When they saw the star they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. These were happy, happy, happy wise men. This was what they had been looking for. Confirmation once again that they were on the right track. Herod's advisers had been right. The star was leading them south towards this town of Bethlehem. They were about to see this baby born as king of the Jews, a child of great, great significance. 
This time as it seems that the star, this light in the night sky, is guiding them all the more clearly until it seems to rest over a particular place. And imagine their joy when on entering that place they find before them this young mother nursing her new baby. This is the place. This is the one. This is this amazing uh, baby born as king of the Jews. Could they have known that this child, this helpless little baby that could only gurgle and cry and sleep and feed and fill his nappy or whatever it was they used back in those days, was actually the one who had created the very stars they took such delight in studying. The one who commanded the stars and the planets from the very beginning, ordering them to be in the right place at the right time, positioning them thousands and thousands of years before, so that at the appointed time they would guide these stargazers to an encounter with him, guide them to rejoice at the birth of the Son of God, the, the Word of Life, the commander of the stars and the planets, the King of Kings and the Saviour of the world. A truly great King had indeed been born, not a future King, but one who was King here and now, snuggling up into his mother's arms. A king in weakness and dependence, in poverty and in need. To me this is the great miracle of the Christmas story. The king of kings, the creator of all things, the one who commands the stars, a tiny helpless baby. So these travellers from the east bring out their gifts, gold for a king, frankincense for a priest, myrrh for his death. And what is my response to this infant king? And what is yours? Surely we too can only worship him and offer him our gifts, the best of ourselves, the best that we can offer him. Indeed, his invitation is still, come to me, come to me. Come to me with your gifts, come to me with all your weaknesses, come to me with your hopes and your dreams come to me with your failures and your fallenness. I'm sure that those wise men were deeply, profoundly affected by their experience, by their encounter with that little baby. But we too are changed as we come to him and worship him and offer him our hearts. Amen.